Well, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, so I thought I'd um, switch over and talk about some research efforts, but I wanted to kind of continue in the theme of light sheet microscopy since we just talked about it and you guys are all uh, experts in light sheet microscopy now. So I want to talk about three different areas. Um, and one is in uh, sort of microfluidics for light sheet microscopy. Uh, I want to talk more about this deconvolution and registration that I mentioned before. And then I want to talk about machine learning and using deep learning to further improve the performance of, of uh, light sheet microscopy. So let's start with the microfluidics. So, you know, um, hopefully I don't have to uh, tell you guys that microfluidics can be enabling, right? So, I mean, if you, this is actually a, a paper from a group in NCBS, I think, which was published uh, a decade ago where they use microfluidics to immobilize worms. But these techniques are really useful to still today, right? If you want to do chronic immobilization and imaging of specimens, particularly at high resolution, right? Where if the organism is moving around, it can be useful to kind of immobilize it, scan it for a bit, let it go, and then immobilize it again. One of the challenges though in doing microfluidics is that the refractive index of the material is often mismatched to the aqueous sample. So if you think about PDMS, right, which is the polymer most often used in microfluidics, the refractive index of PDMS is 1.40, but the refractive index of an aqueous specimen is gonna be close to water, 1.33. And this difference in refractive index can create aberrations and degrade the quality of your imaging when you image through uh, mismatch. So for example, if you look at beads, uh, subdiffractive beads, if you image them on glass where the microscope objective is designed to look, they can estimate the point spread function. They should look diffraction limited. But if you image them through PDMS with a water dipping lens or, wa or a water lens, now they get aberrated. And if you image them through a polymer of refractive index matched uh, close to the, uh, the, the, the uh, index of the water, now they appear, uh, they appear tight again, they appear close to the fraction limit. And in light sheet microscopy, this issue, this issue can be a real problem if you're using a water dipping lens, you know, as you often do when imaging aqueous specimens. You have kind of two problems. One is that the light sheet itself will bend uh, from low to, to high refractive index. Even more serious than that though, you can get a, uh, a detection defocus, a focal shift. And this was shown nicely by this paper of Tim Holy's several years ago, oops, where if you image beads in water, they appear diffraction limited over the field of view. If you image them at progressive, uh, progressive distances from uh, an index mismatch, like say PDMS microfluidic, the beads get progressively more and more and more aberrated the further and further in uh, or away from the boundary you are. And this is because the detection plane defocuses and it's as if the beads appear from a different plane. One way of getting around this problem is to use a technique called adaptive optics, uh, but that's kind of uh, somewhat labor intensive and hardware intensive approach. A much easier approach would just be to make the refractive index of everything, including the microfluidic, the same as the aqueous specimen. And if you go that route, the sort of wish list for refractive index match materials would be ideally, they would have the same refractive index as water or the specimen you're looking at. Ideally, the polymer should be biocompatible. You know, it should be easy to work with. And ideally, you would just buy it, right, and use it. And we've identified a polymer that we think satisfies many of these criteria, in fact, all of the criteria. It's called Bio-133. And this is index matched to water and it enables diffraction limited imaging, even if you image through it. So if we go back to the DICEBEM, this, this light sheet microscope I mentioned earlier, if you try to image beads through a layer of different polymers, you can see different um, aberrations. If there is no polymer, the bead appears diffraction limited. But if you image it through PDMS, it appears badly aberrated. And the thing is, the, the thicker the polymer, the worse the aberration gets. I've kind of quantified that in this size, this full width at half max of the bead as you image through thicker and thicker polymer. Even through uh, FEP or P or PEGDA, these are two polymers that are pretty close to the refractive index. You can still observe aberrations, but through Bio-133, it's as if the polymer isn't there. Uh, the, the, the microscope doesn't see it because the refractive index is, is identical to water uh, up until this third decimal place over here. So it appears to provide best-in-class performance when you're imaging through it. Another nice thing about Bio-133 is that you can use it 
uh, in many different ways. So in some cases, like we image worms a lot in my lab, you can just take the liquid bio 133 formulation uh, you know, it's, it's not toxic to the worm, so the worm can just be inside a drop of the liquid. And then it's UV curable. So with a handheld UV lamp, you can cure the polymer outside the worm. It doesn't seem to perturb the worm at all. There's still a gas exchange through the polymer, and then you can just image in this immobilized fashion. On the other hand, you can also do fancier stuff. So if you're doing uh, PDMS soft lithography, those workflows translate towards Bio-133 with minimal modification. So you can use soft lithography can, uh, uh, methods to also shape this polymer for uh, microfluidic applications. And then it's also commercially available from a company in Israel called My Polymers. You can just buy a, a vat of it and then uh, use it as you like. And I wanna show some examples of, of using this to do light sheet microscopy. So uh, some of our collaborators image Drosophila imaginal disc and they image these um, this, this pioneer neuron system, TSM1 and, uh, and L3. And they usually image it in a spinning disc, but they can't image for very long in a spinning disc because of volumetric bleaching. So the problem in the dye spin is, is how to immobilize these wings. And in the case of Bio-133, we just made a very simple immobilization setup. We, we polymerized slabs of Bio-133 with spacers uh, they were about 13 microns in thickness. We cut slabs and then arranged the wings in a row and then put another slab of Bio-133 over the wings so that they wouldn't float away in the buffer. And then we could image uh, for hundreds of volumes without any noticeable photo bleaching. Uh, these, the, the, the dynamics of these membranes uh, uh, signals in, in these two axons in the system. And so our collaborators were happy because they can image the dynamics at higher speed and for longer than, than in the spinning disc microscope. So just one sort of simple example where we were imaging from one side in this dice bin. You can also do isotropic imaging, in this case, looking at uh, nervous system structure in worms. So in this case, we built a little microfluidic chip out of Bio-133 and we used vacuum to immobilize worms and channels of the chip. And then the, the imaging was sufficiently good that we could image um, these amphid neurons labeled with GFP and their axons from both sides do the registration and deconvolution to get fairly high resolution images of these axons, uh, isotropic images. You can also do functional imaging. So we have uh, another worm where we targeted GCAMP 6S to all of the neurons in the head of the worm. And again, the imaging was sufficiently good in these, uh, in these worms that we could get nice, uh, we, we could do tracking. We could segment and track more than 100 neurons in the head of the animal, why they were immobilized, and, and then look at sort of delta F over F traces to see which neurons were spontaneously firing in synchrony. Again, in this kind of simple uh, microfluidic chip. So um, one other point that I, I wanna make again is that this is uh, biocompatible. So cells will actually grow on this polymer. And if you do kind of a simple assay where you just look at cell growth, over time, it's kind of statistically indistinguishable from growing the cells on glass cover slips. They appear to grow at the sort of roughly the same rate. The morphology is at least to first order the same. And so this means you can image cells on films of Bio-133 and then put these films on PDMS wells, which you can just buy from a, a company and then image through them with the light sheet. And so then you can get isotropic images, in this case of TOM20, through the bio-133 well in these mitochondria, um, extended volumetric isotropic uh, volumes without any obvious photo bleaching. You can also do imaging in, in high-speed structured illumination microscopy. This is not a light sheet microscope, but a, 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 what we call the instant sim for higher resolution. And again, imaging through 50 microns of this polymer with a 1.2 NA water lens, and you can get these sort of uh, higher resolution images of the mitochondria. So one thing that I think might be interested, interesting to explore that we haven't yet is trying to do traction force microscopy through this polymer because it doesn't really aberrate the specimen. And so you could try and measure forces as well as morphologies of, of cells through this polymer. You can also do stimulation with this polymer. So our collaborators um, are really interested in these neurons in the head of C. elegans that are sensitive to different chemical odors. And so by adapting a PDMS chip uh, they could immobilize worms and then flow through diacetyl and then image in their diaspim through a layer of bio-133. And so you could apply a buffer uh, through the buffer, this diacetyl, and then read out 
the, the stimulus through the dendrite and the soma, uh, again, just by flowing it through this, this PDMS channel un underneath the worms. Um, you can also do uh, optogenetic stimulation. So if we have worms that express crimson, which, which you can stimulate optogenetically with a red LED beneath the worm, you can then do repeated optogenetic stimulation and then use GCAMP to read out the fluorescence and the axons, the dendrite and the soma. So again, just sort of um, optogenetic and chemogenetic stimulation, but now in the light sheet microscope, in the dice bib. And then finally, we did sort of a proof of concept experiment where we took um, different wells, uh, again, these mitochondria, GFP mitochondria in, and then image them through the dice bim. And you can sort of see in this movie, in the control well, the mitochondria are kind of doing their thing. If we add CCCP, which is a mitochondrial uncoupler, the mitochondria change their shape. So you can do, I think this, this lends itself well to microfluidic applications, drug screening, for example, and again, this dice bim geometry without sacrificing any resolution. So just a battery of different applications to kind of pique your curiosity and stimulate thinking as to what you might be able to use this for. So to kind of sum up this first third of my talk, I've told you about this polymer bio-133, which is useful. It's index matched to water. It seems to be best in class in terms of its optical properties. It doesn't introduce any additional aberrations. It's biocompatible, easy to work with, and it's useful, I think, for sample mobilization, particularly in light sheet microscopy. But you might find advantages in other applications as well if you're using PDMS and imaging through PDMS. And I just want to acknowledge the folks that did the work, uh, Xiao Fei Han and Pluto in my lab, uh, we, and then um, Hamilton and Dirk's lab, our collaborators lab, and various others that helped us with sample preparation and microfluidics. So I now want to shift gears entirely and talk about deconvolution a little bit and some work we've done in this area. So deconvolution is, is a method that has been around for decades, and it can improve the effective contrast and resolution in your images, right? So the idea is that the image that comes out that you record on your microscope is always degraded by blurring by the point spread function and by noise. And so, but if you if you know what the point spread function is, and if you can characterize the noise, then deconvolution gives you a computational way of somewhat reversing the degradation. So you get a little bit closer to the, you know, what you hope is actually there, the specimen. It's never a complete reversal of the blur or a complete reversal of the noise, but you can get better than the raw data. Um, and so, you know, one, one popular method that is, an, uh, well, actually, before I get there, I, you know, I just want to remind you again that these methods are useful not just in conventional single objective systems, but also in multi-objective systems like light sheet microscopy. So as I said before, in the dice bim, we take two views of the specimen and then we, we register and we deconvolve them in order to get better reconstructions of the underlying sample. And there have been others that do this as well. So Philip Keller, for example, in his ISO view, light sheet microscope images much larger specimens with four objectives and does the same kind of processing to improve resolution. So the, the sort of uh, computational ingredient is registration and deconvolution, but this is actually a major computational burden. Uh, especially for large volumes. It's not trivial to do this, and you can end up spending a lot of time using computers to do these post-processing operations. In fact, a lot more time than it takes to acquire the data. And so we wanted to do something about that to speed it up. And so what I want to tell you about are some methods for speeding up deconvolution. Now, the particular method that we and many others use is a method called Richardson-Lucy iterative deconvolution. And this, this technique is not new. It's been around since the 70s. And you can understand this, this kind of a mapping between the space of the object. This is a thing you always want, but never get out of your microscope. And then the image, the image is what you actually record. And so this equation, this iterative equation, which I've written down here, it's just a single line, gives you a prescription for progressively deblurring the image so that you get an estimate, E, which is more like the object. And you can think about this as mapping between the object and the image uh, using a, a function called a forward projector, or equivalently this little f term. This is often the point spread function of the microscope. And then you map from the image back to the object using this backwards function b, or little b in this equation. Little b is often taken to be the transpose point spread function. And, and so you, and this funny cross, symbol here just means blur or convolution. So by applying this equation iteratively over and over and over again, 
you can improve your underlying estimate of the object E. Now, I said it's iterative, right? So that means you do it for some number of times. And one way of speeding up this deconvolution is to try and reduce the number of iterations. So, you know, if you uh, work long enough in microscopy, you find out that there's really nothing new under the sun anymore. And in fact, when we were researching this, we found out that there was this idea in medical physics more than two decades ago, where these, these uh, radiologists, uh, I think they were radiologists, showed that you could get faster richardson lucy deconvolution if the eigenvalue spectrum of F times B clusters together or is as flat as possible. So that's fine. Like, what, what, what does that actually mean? So for that, for those of you that have forgotten your linear algebra, I just want to kind of break this down a little bit for you. So in the, in the case of fluorescence microscopy, you can talk about your imaging model as being convolutional, meaning your image is the result of a convolution between the object and the blurring function F plus some noise term. And that, that means that because it's a convolutional equation, if you Fourier transform that equation, you can write it as a product of Fourier transforms, right? This convolution becomes a, a multiplication. And so the Fourier transform of the image is given by the product of the Fourier transform of the object times the Fourier transform of the blurring function plus some noise term. And that is equivalent to saying that these two functions F and B are diagonalized by the Fourier transform. So their eigenvalues are given by the Fourier transforms of these functions, the point spread function and its transpose. Okay, so what does that actually mean? How can we use this to do faster deconvolution? Well, by following this initial result, this means that you can get faster deconvolution if you choose the function B, such that the Fourier transform product of F and B tends towards a constant or one. Or if you rearrange these terms, you wanna pick B such that the Fourier transform of B is one over the Fourier transform of F. Or in real space, you pick F and B such that they're, when you convolve them together, you get a delta function. So that's, that's all very mathematical. I will now try and show you what that actually means in terms of the image. But this is a, the take home point of this is, is that this is a prescription for doing faster deconvolution. And for those of you that happen to think about transfer functions, another way of thinking about this is you wanna pick B such that B is like an inverse optical transfer function in the Fourier domain. But let me give you some images, which I hope will make this a little bit less abstract. So here's an image of some mitochondria that I imaged with a high-speed structural illumination microscope, what I call the instant simmed, also developed in my lab some years ago. The raw data is, uh, is okay, but it's not as good as if you deconvolve this data. And if you use traditional richardson lucy de deconvolution, it would take 15 iterations to get this uh, sharper image with a bit better resolution. And so you can think about the forward projector F as the point spread function and the backwards projector B traditionally of being as being the transpose of the forward, which is just the same thing. If you look at the Fourier transforms of, their, of these two functions, their product is not especially flat. It doesn't look very constant in the frequency domain, but you can start to tweak this backwards projector B so that the, the product of the forward and the backward projectors start to be somewhat more constant. So in this case, I've made this more Gaussian, and now it only takes nine iterations to get the same result. If I tweak this function a little bit more, now, now this product is a little bit more constant now it takes only four iterations. And if I derive the limiting form, what I call the Wiener Butterworth back projector, now the product in frequency space right up until the resolution limit is constant. And so now I can get the same answer, but in only one iteration. So I've just sped up my deconvolution by more than an order of magnitude by just changing one term, B, in this Richardson Lucy deconvolution iterate. Uh, uh, update. So that's, again, sort of the punchline that I want you to take away, that I can get the same answer to within noise by just changing one term in this richardson lucy Lucy equation. And this turns out to be quite general. So you can use this in many different kinds of microscopes. So in a confocal microscope, if it, looking at microtubules here, it would normally take 10 iterations to get the resolution limited result. And you can see as you change this back projector, you can do this now in only one iteration. In a single view light sheet microscope looking at nuclei again, uh, you get this order of magnitude improvement. And if you use this in wide field microscopy looking at actin, now what would take 20 iterations takes only one iteration.
So this improvement in, in speed also translates to multi-view light sheet microscopy. So if we go back to the example of the dice bin, if we, look, if we take two views of these C. elegans embryos, here expressing uh, magenta is labeling the nuclei expressing GFP histone and green is labeling the neurons. It would normally, if we look at the raw data, first of all, the Z resolution is worse than the lateral resolution. We can make this more isotropic by doing this joint deconvolution, but it takes us 10 iterations. We can get the same result using this Wiener Butterworth deconvolution, but now in only one iteration. So this also works in multi-view microscopes. And you know, we can build more complicated multi-view microscopes where we take four views of a, micro, of a, of a, of a um, sample instead of just one view uh, or two views. In this case, we, we built a, a triple objective setup that takes four views of this Chercat T cell expressing actin. If you look at the raw data, it looks sort of okay, but it's kind of blurry. If we deconvolve the results after registering all four views, we can get quite a bit sharper reconstruction, but it takes 90 iterations. We can drive this down to five iterations using this Wiener Butterworth form of this uh, Richardson Lucy deconvolution. So that's that's all well and good. But one problem for large data sets, especially, is that the image registration is more of a bottleneck than the deconvolution. So remember, one step we have to do before we deconvolve the data for these multi-view light sheet recordings is the registration of these different views. And that registration method basically tries to find a mapping, an image registration that maps based on the intensity in each image, one volume onto another volume. And that's very general. It works for almost any sample, but it's slow to do it. How slow? Well, if we think about a C. elegans, the C. elegans embryo or the T cell, you can see from these graphs that it takes orders of magnitude more time to register the data than to deconvolve it. And if we look at larger volumes, in this case, the group of cells called the lateral line primordium that deposits neuromasts in an embryonic zebrafish, this is a two terabyte raw, raw data set, and it takes just a silly amount of time to do the registration. So we also want to speed up our registration software. And so we also did that, and there was kind of a two-pronged approach. The first uh, approach was just practical, which was moving our methods to a, a GPU implementation. So we took all of our registration code and we rewrote it in CUDA so that it ran on a GPU. And this bought us something because now we can parallelize using the many cores in a GPU. The other thing we did though is more kind of algorithmic. And that is that we, we found that we could get a faster and more robust registration if we broke up our registration so that we iteratively registered First, we optimize translation, then rotation, then scaling, then shearing. Um, basically, if you, if you kind of break the problem up into a series of sub-steps, you get a more accurate and a faster and more robust registration. And so this buys us more than an order of magnitude uh, in registration speed. And it's about 10 to 70 times faster than nifty rag and elastics, which are two other uh, sort of state-of-the-art registration methods. So if we put this improvement in speed, for registration together with this trick for deconvolution that I mentioned, it buys us orders of magnitude. And so if we go back to this zebrafish example, in this case, we were taking one volume, one dual view volume every 30 seconds. And this kind of 450 fold uh, speed up in registration speed meant that we could actually basically keep up uh, in this post-processing. And I think you know, the reason it's important to develop computational methods that are faster is that in this case, the biologist that we were collaborated with was really interested in segmenting all of these cells or most of the cells in the volume. And so if you try and do that on the raw data, you get less, you get just over half the cells. If you can register and deconvolve all of the, all of the data, then you can get almost all of them using a fairly canned uh, segmentation algorithm. And so if the user eventually wants to feed back on this data, say, you know, apply a pulse of light or photoactivate or something based on where the cells are, it can be very useful to be able to keep up with the acquisition. And so that's why I think, you know, trying to get faster methods could be important. And, and for data sets like this, we can now almost do that. Another application where I think it could be useful is something we talked about earlier in the didactic session, which is now it's possible to, you know, using these cleared tissue lenses and using Clarity or iDisco or other clearing methods, you can, you can really interrogate much larger volumes of tissue. In this case, this coronal brain slice using our cleared tissue dice bin, we could record this data set in, in just a few minutes. 
but it, it would have taken us hundreds of hours to register and deconvolve this data set with sub-micron resolution. Now we can drive this down to a few hours on a consumer grade GPU. And with more GPUs and with better GPUs, you can also speed this up. So I think this is another area where if you want to image from multiple sides, from multiple views, and you need to do post-processing, it can be helpful to do this more quickly. So I want to talk about one final application for this for this deconvolution. And that is um, sort of this other area, which is that, you know, it's always bothered me that in any fluorescence microscope, you only collect a small amount of the fluorescence emitted by the sample. So in the case of the, you know, the dye spoon, typically we use these moderate NA objective lenses. And so that means we collect less than half the fluorescence, even neglecting any other losses in the microscope, right? Because we're limited by this cone of collection. Oh, is somebody asking a question? Uh, sorry, uh, Hari, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, yeah, no worries. So, so one way of beat it, one way of doing better with uh, collection is to instead of putting your samples on glass cover slips, you could grow them on mirrors, mirrored cover slips. And if you do that, this mirror has two effects. One is that it physically reflects the light sheet. So now you have two light sheets instead of one. But you, there's another advantage, which is just like when you look at yourself in a mirror, you gain a perspective you would otherwise never see, in this case of the sample. So the mirror provides virtual views of the sample because the light that would otherwise be lost through the cover slip and not collected has a chance to be reflected back and you can image that. So each of these objectives sees not just the real light sheet view, but also the virtual view of the reflection coming back. And so this means you can, in principle, collect double or quadruple the amount of information that you initially would have in a single view light sheet microscope. The trade-off is that you have this increased epifluorescence contamination because each objective doesn't just see the light sheet view, it also sees this cone of epifluorescence contamination. And so that contaminates your raw data, the four views here of the muscle uh, in, a, in, a, in a C. elegans embryo. Now you can model that uh, blur and remove it using deconvolution. The problem is that now the point spread function varies over the field of view. It's no longer the same in the middle of the field of view or as at the edges of the field of view. And if you model that and try and incorporate it in your deconvolution, now you need hundreds or thousands of 3D convolutions in your deconvolution. And that is incredibly time consuming if you're doing 10 iterations or so per time point, right? So traditionally in Richardson Lucy, if you did 20 iterations of Richardson Lucy deconvolution, it would take 14 minutes to deconvolve one volume. And when you consider you can take the data in the whole volume of four volumes in less than a second. And that's orders of magnitude mismatch again in this deconvolution speed. Now, this Richardson-Lucy deconvolution, excuse me, the Wiener-Butterworth deconvolution buys you an order of magnitude, but that's still about 90 seconds. That's still much longer than it takes to acquire the data. So we wanted to find ways of improving the speed in this difficult to deconvolve scenario where the point spread function varies across the field of view. And so we turn to deep learning to do this. Now, deep learning has been getting a lot of buzz lately, but in fact, the idea is decades old. The idea is that you have the data, you have some feature of the data you want to learn, and if you stack these nonlinear mathematical operations in a, in a particular way uh, and then use gradient descent, if there is a statistical relationship to be learned between the data and some feature of the data, these neural networks will find it. And this has been used in image segmentation or in prediction, where if you have like bright field images of cells and fluorescence images of cells, if you give these neural networks enough examples of the same sample in these two different modalities, in some cases, you can use the bright field images to predict the, say, the nuclei. And so we use the same idea to do this difficult deconvolution. So we built something we call the dense decon neural network to take the four views of the specimen and then spit out the, the, the result, the, the spatially uh, deconvolved result using all four views. And we could train the neural network using the, the ground truth that we could acquire using classical methods. And once trained, this deep learning method is much, much faster than the traditional methods, orders of magnitude faster. So this means that it's actually feasible to deconvolve these data sets. In this case, looking at GCAMP dynamics in these muscles and C. elegans embryo, 
you know, you can get a, a, a nice deconvolution traditionally or the Wiener Butterworth result, but you can get that same result to within noise using this trained neural network orders of magnitude faster. And when you get that improvement in speed, you can also start to play games with the hardware. So our collaborator had a lattice light sheet microscope with a higher detection NA, 1.1 NA. And so using this reflective cover slip, in principle, you can gain a second view at high NA, uh, almost orthogonal view, which you can use to increase axial resolution to basically double the resolution of the native lattice light sheet microscope. But combining these data sets is, is not trivial because of the spatially varying blur. Using deep learning, we can improve our speed of deconvolution orders of magnitude. And now we can observe these beautiful uh, dynamics of this alpha actin in, in, a cover, in, in a single cell uh, using this method. So I think for difficult to deconvolve cases, I think de de uh, deep learning has a particular uh, benefit. Uh, and this, this may, be, may be useful to you guys as well. So to kind of summarize this part of my talk, I told you about a trick where you could modify one term in a classical deconvolution scheme called Richardson-Lucy that significantly reduces the number of iterations. I told you about a GPU optimized 3D registration method for multi-view fusion. This is also useful for stitching data. And then I mentioned deep learning as a method for further increasing speed, especially for difficult scenarios where the blur varies across the field of view. And you know, if you put these methods together, you get orders of magnitude improvement in post-processing speed. And this works in many different kinds of microscopes. And there are many folks that are starting to use these methods. The code is all freely available. You can read our paper uh, published in Nature Biotechnology last, last year, and the code is available on this GitHub website, or you can just email us if you'd like to try it. Um, so in the last part of my talk, I want to just talk a bit more about uh, deep learning, because I think this is a technique that is here to stay. And my particular interest in this is in image restoration, right? So one of the problems with uh, microscopy, with the, with the physics in the microscopy is that there are trade-offs, right? It's very difficult to build fluorescence microscopes that both have awesome spatial resolution, amazing speed, don't fry or sample, and give you great signal to noise ratio. Usually, any one of these axes comes at the expense of another one. Now, deep learning gives you a way of using prior information to extend the space of what's possible. And so, you know, there are many groups that were kind of, that are getting involved in this. I was particularly taken with this paper in Nature Methods by Vigert and colleagues several years ago, where they had a so-called content-aware restoration framework for doing this. And so we were particularly interested in adapting similar methods to both improve resolution and denoise uh, our data. And so we did that. We collaborated with a machine vision company called, uh, called S-Vision to extend this to, to three-dimensional volumes. And we used a particular architecture called residual channel attention network. Uh, this was, we didn't invent this, but we extended it to fluorescence volumes. And the reason we picked this architecture is it was supposedly better at preserving high resolution information than alternative neural networks. And so, um, you know, I'm not gonna really get into the details in this talk, but to just say that, the workflow for these methods is always the same. In the case of denoising, you have, say, high SNR, high signal-to-noise ratio data, and low signal-to-noise ratio data. You use these pairs of matched data sets to train a neural network, and then once the neural network is trained, you can challenge it with noisy data the network has never seen before, and then it, if it works, it should restore that data and improve the signal-to-noise ratio. And to cut a long story short, this works remarkably well. So to give an example, uh, now, not in a light sheet microscope, but in a structured illumination microscope, this instant sim that I mentioned before, this provides great resolution, sub-organelle resolution. In this case, we're looking at mitochondria, uh, the maximum intensity pro projection from, from U2OS cell transfected with mitochondria. And you can see that the first volume in this series is great. It's high resolution. You can see individual mitochondria. And if I play this movie, it bleaches rapidly because this is not a light sheet microscope, right? We extinguish more than half the fluorescence in 10 volumes, less than 10 volumes. So one way of mitigating this, this problem is to turn the laser intensity way down. The problem then is that the data are just garbage. But if you use a neural network, you can restore this data to the point where the data actually are usable. And so now using this structured illumination microscope, we could image for thousands of volumes or tens of thousands of images and our input laser intensity is low enough, it's lower than the rate of photo bleaching. And so 
uh, and so you actually, the fluorescence actually increases over time, which is remarkable. I've never really seen that in any super resolution microscope. Um, and so I think this is exciting because it's a way of subverting one kind of microscope. We're using a structured illumination microscope, but as a light sheet microscope. So this gives you a way of kind of bending the rules a bit uh, where, you know, maybe you don't have a light sheet microscope, or maybe you really need the higher resolution of a different microscope. Now you can get that using this uh, neural network framework. Um, and, and so this works in different, uh, different. you can do multicolor imaging as well. So another example, looking at mitochondria in green and lysosomes in red, labeled with, labeled with M apple. In this case, the raw data, again, is just total garbage. You can't see very many lysosomes, lysosomes but if I denoise this data, using this RCAN, now I have sufficiently good data that I can actually measure interactions between lysosomes and mitochondria, right? So it actually becomes a usable data set over hundreds of volumes. Um, and so uh, again, just to motivate what is possible with, with denoising in these methods. We've also used these for de-blurring, right? So the idea here is that you have some low resolution data, some high resolution version of that same data that you some somehow collect, you use that to train a neural network, and then you challenge the network or the blurry image that it's never seen before, and then you can sharpen it up. And so in this particular example, we took um, cells labeled with sur DNA, marking the DNA, and then we imaged them on a confocal microscope, and we trained a neural network with seed volumes of confocal data and stead data of the same sample. Now, even confocal uh, microscopes are not great for imaging dividing cells at high resolution, but if you turn the laser way down, you can actually do it, uh, albeit with very noisy output data. And so you can see here in a resonant confocal microscope, we can actually see these volumes divide, cellular volumes divide, divide but the signal to noise ratio is terrible. We can restore both resolution and, and noise by using this network that was trained with stead data. You know, you can, I think the improvement in resolution is also clear, but particularly when the cell starts to assume this kind of interface structure at the end, right? You can see all of this structure that is kind of hard to see in the raw data. So this, this is kind of exciting, I think, for confocal microscopes, but we also can improve the resolution in our instant sim. So we trained neural networks where we have instant sim and expansion microscopy ground truth. And so that also works. You can see in the instant sim data here of a jerkat T cell with microtubules in this uh, sort of uh, cell that is trying to spread on an antibody coated cover slip, the input data is kind of blurry, especially in Z. And we can recover a lot of detail in the Z dimension by using this neural network. Another example in mitochondria, if we look at this cell in cross section from Z, it can be hard to discern the individual mitochondria, but we can restore that data, uh, particularly in the Z dimension, you're using this RCAN framework. So again, you know, I think this could be useful if you need a bit more resolution than the native resolution provided by your uh, SIM or provided by your confocal data and have the means to generate training data. So I want to sort of bring it back to light sheet microscopy in the last example, which is that, you know, I'm sort of obsessed with this problem of trying to segment all the nuclei in a worm embryo, and we can't quite do it with our uh, light sheet microscope. We just don't have quite enough resolution uh, in three-dimensional volumes, particularly on the far side of the, the embryo, the aberrations and scattering mean that even if you have a high NA detection lens, the data are just not quite good enough, right, to segment the, the you have this sort of depth varying uh, aberration that builds up and scattering, and you're trying to keep the embryo alive, so the illumination has to be kind of low. So we built three neural networks to kind of sequentially de-aberrate, isotropize, and super-resolve the data. And so this works pretty well. So we have one neural network where we add aberrations and noise synthetically. We then de-aberrate them using one RCAN network. We then have a second neural network because we're imaging with a dye spin we can acquire from both views and get isotropic ground truth, train the neural network to take the de-aberrated data, oops, and then uh, deconvolve it. And then we have a final neural network where we have expanded C. elegans embryos with higher resolution, and we can use this to improve resolution. And this, this actually works fairly well. If you put all of these, in, these together, if you compare the data in the input to the output data, the nuclei are much better resolved. Importantly, for, for our purposes, the spacing between the nuclei is also better resolved. And I think this is exciting because this may be one of the more gentle ways of attaining super resolution, right? Without changing, changing the underlying 
way that the microscope acquires data. And so you can acquire four-dimensional data, but then denoise it and deblur it and improve significantly the underlying resolution using this approach. Um, you can see, especially in areas where the, you know, there's quite a bit of scatter, we can discern all of these nuclei. So this is something we're using now routinely in our lab to try and get better reconstructions of the nuclei. I think there are challenges and, um, you know, as well as, well, one final thing I'll just say, you know, the way that I view these, these machine learning techniques is that without them, you have this kind of classic way in which we all operate our microscopes. You have your microscope, you take some data, uh, and you know, maybe if you know the point spread function, you can do deconvolution to improve the data. But fundamentally, if you need a higher resolution uh, image or you need to take the data more gently, it's back to the drawing board and you use a different microscope. I think what deep learning lets you do is it gives you another hook back into the data where the data itself can improve the data. And so this is sort of an added benefit. It just gives us more ways of playing with our data. And I think there are lots of challenges as well as opportunities in this field. You know, the big challenge, right, if you're a biologist is to try and figure out how much of what you see can you actually believe? That's the elephant in the room. And, you know, from a microscopy perspective, the question is how much spatial resolution and signal to noise ratio can be improved because there are limits. It behooves us to test those limits. How linear are the results? How little or how much training data do we need? As an instrument developer, I'm very interested in knowing to what extent can hybrid computational and optical methods uh, be, uh, um, you know, how can we use these methods to bypass the inherent physical limitations of the microscope? And finally, I think it's worth remembering that at the end of the day, none of us actually care about images, right? We want some feature of the image. And so this may sound like science fiction, but I think one day maybe we'll get to the point where the neural network just does it all, right? It just autonomously drives the microscope and it tells you, you know, how many cells divide or how many mitochondria they are and so on and so forth. I think that, that may be where all of this is going. But before we get there, there's kind of a practical problem, which is how do we get these methods in, in the hands of biologists? What training programs and hardware need to be in place so that more and more scientists can explore and break and use these methods? And all of that is sort of an interesting challenge and also an opportunity. So with that, I just like to thank everybody that contributed here. I didn't, I didn't really do any of this myself. I'm just lucky that we have awesome collaborators both within the NIH and outside, particularly on the hardware and machine vision side. And then I'd like to acknowledge my lab, both the current lab and the alumni and this, this uh, imaging facility here at NIH that I now uh, supervise.